Good morning everyone, it's Easter Saturday and uh, we are going to be doing a very, very quick and easy recipe today. Um, it's uh, gluten-free fruit scones. The reason I picked this one is, first of all, it's very few ingredients. Um, so if you are struggling to get ingredients at your local shop or online delivery, um, hopefully you will have these in your cupboard or your fridge. Um, you can also make it, as well as gluten-free, you can also make it vegan. Um, so it will hopefully um, be great for quite a few of our uh, allergy sufferers, um, particularly a lot of my clients who have multiple allergies as well. But the other reason I wanted to do this recipe is because I've had a lot of requests for really simple recipes that children could do, either on their own if they're slightly older, or um, you know supervised um, and this is actually a really good Easter weekend um, cookery um, recipe that you could do so welcome everyone if you're joining us live uh, we will also be posting this on our Facebook page and also uh, on YouTube as well so um, if you've got a cup of tea um, get yourself a little notebook and because uh, I will be actually telling you the quantities of all the ingredients as well um, and then you can get cooking today. I've had a couple of queries before we start about gluten-free flour because uh, there's a lot of problems with people getting gluten-free flour whether it's you know the bread one whether it's plain self-raising whatever. Um, on my website, um, welcome everyone, I know everyone's just joining in, we haven't started yet so please don't worry, but on my website um, you will see a blog on gluten-free flours and at the end of that blog I've given you a couple of blends that you can make your own blend. I've recently, and I'm not joking, I've been raiding my cupboards, finding various different flours, all gluten-free, from sorghum to maize to rice to whatever, and I've just been playing around again with different blends, and I've managed to make gluten-free scones, bread, um, so it is possible. If you've still got various flours, whether it's buckwheat, rice flour, tapioca, corn flour, you can combine those to make a really good blend. There are a few places online. Some people on some of the gluten-free networks have said Glebe Farm are really good. Uh, so, um, and I think, although you probably would have to get a big case, but Glebe Farm seem to be a very good one for being able to send out a range of different flowers as well. Um, Shepton Mill, I don't know whether they're doing online orders, but I've previously got some of my gluten-free flowers from Shepton Mill. Obviously there's places like Holland and Barrett online and so on, um, but they are taking quite a long time getting actual um, flowers out. It's taken two or three weeks for just placing one order to get anything. But hopefully you'll find a few places online if your local stores are just not stocking gluten-free flowers. I've been very fortunate because I bake a lot. I generally have a lot of flowers uh, in my cupboards um, and our bread makers generally on a lot of the time. Managed to get yeast for the first time the other day from my local co-op, so that's great. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us. We're just about to get started. This is a really good one for children. So if you've got children, bring them to your iPad, phone, whatever. Get them to watch because it'll be great to get children um, you know, cooking and learning some skills. So in GCSE Food and Tech, um, one of the skills among many that they have to really master is rubbing in. And this is a really easy one for learning that skill. It's crucial for a lot of basic recipes from pastry to um, things like scones um, and so on. So it's a really good one to get them um, familiar with. So first thing, get your pen and paper ready because I'm going to read out all the ingredients as well. I make this all the time, it's sort of ingrained in me now. And the nice thing about this recipe is if you don't want fruit scones, make them into cheese or onion or sun-dried tomato or herb scones or just plain scones. So you can vary the um, additional ingredients. So in my bowl here, 225 grams of plain gluten-free flour. 
I haven't tried it with rice flour. I suspect you would have to combine rice with something like tapioca or corn flour. I think rice would be a little bit too dry on its own. Again, haven't tried yet buckwheat, but a blend might actually be quite good. Buckwheat is quite a strong flour on its own. Um, you know, it's great for pancakes, but for scones, mm, if you've got it lying around, play around with it. Um, but this is just the Dove's Farm free, uh, gluten-free plain flour. So that's 225 grams, if you didn't catch that, into a bowl. Um, really simple ingredients, this, so it's not a lot to um, hopefully uh, worry about. Then I like to use, because this is vegan, uh, or it can be vegan, um, I'm not using eggs or anything like that. Normally scones don't really have eggs in any way. Um, but just to help it bind, just a quarter to a half a teaspoon of xanthan gum. I'm still able to get xanthan gum at the moment. Um, so hopefully you can get xanthan gum. Haven't tried it with psyllium husks. Welcome everyone if you're just joining us because I know some people are just joining in. We've only just started. You will be able to see this um, on repeat on Facebook. So please don't worry. 225 grams of gluten-free plain flour, a quarter to half a teaspoon of xanthan gum. And I think we've got a, a quick question, which I'll answer now. Hi, question from uh, Natasha, would coconut flour work? Oh, hi Natasha. No, coconut flour would definitely not work. I can tell you that for sure. I have got on my website lots of coconut flour recipes, but I warn you now, you need eggs for coconut flour. Um, I, I'm managing to get eggs, we have chickens as well, um, but there's some really good recipes, um, including things like muffins, which would be sort of similar uh, for coconut flour. Coconut flour is very dense, it's very absorbent. Um, so for something light like a scone, you can make something similar, sort of paleo, but not this recipe. Um, another question, I think, as well. A uh, question from Sue. Can you use bread flour? Hi, Sue. Yes, you could. You could use bread flour. You probably wouldn't need the xanthan gum. Um, bread flour uh, generally is a combination of three or four types of flours, including some starchy things like tapioca, potato. And normally, check your one, but normally they will have a bit of xanthan gum in there as well. But you could... Um, I would save it because it's really hard to find bread flour and make some bread. I've got some really good recipes on my um, uh, website for, for general gluten-free bread and a brioche as well, which is to die for. So that would be a really good way of using your bread flour. Um, and another question as well. Sorry, just from Susie, can you just remind everyone of what flour you are using? Yeah, hi Susie. So uh, in here, I'm using 225 grams of the free gluten-free plain flour one. I was just explaining that I know a lot of people are having problems getting gluten-free flours. Glebe Farm Online, um, you may be able to get Shepton Mill, um, Holland and Barrett. There's a few places which will sell it still at a reasonable price, because I know on eBay there's been some weird things where people have been charging a fortune just for one bag of flour. Um, you might get away with a combination of, say, lingering around in your cupboard. I think buckwheat on its own would be too strong. To that, I have added a quarter of a teaspoon of xanthan gum. You may need half a teaspoon, depending on your flour, but I, I generally just add a little bit just to bind it. You may be able to use psyllium husks if you've got those in your cupboard. Then I'm adding some baking powder. So I generally add about one, one and a half heaped teaspoons of baking flour. As you know, if you are celiac, check the powder is gluten free. So just double check whatever you've been given, um, you know, whether you're doing it online or whatever, because sometimes I've had the place suitable at all. Um, so those are the three ingredients first. We've just got another question. A uh, question from a, uh, a different Sue this time. Does I it see. matter if gluten-free flour I have is self-raising? No, no, in fact, you, you, what I would do is if you have the self-raising one, probably omit the baking powder altogether or just reduce it. So instead of say one and a half heaped teaspoons, maybe add just half a teaspoon of baking powder um, no, the self-raising would be perfect, really, really nice. Um, now, if you want these to be sweet, so I'm doing fruit scones today, um, I like using just a little bit of xylitol, just because it's a low glycemic, 
natural sweetener from birch, um, you know, good for dental health, as in it doesn't cause dental decay, safe for diabetics, um, slow releasing. Um, so I, I generally sweeten with that rather than sugar. I don't want sugar really in there. Um, you could use um, a little bit of something like coconut sugar. It would affect the colour of the text of the mixture. Um, uh, but you could leave it out. I mean, quite frankly, when I make them, often I forget to even put it in. Uh, the boys don't really seem to care. And it's going to have um, raisins in anyway. So, you know, you don't really need it. Um, but if you do, just a tablespoon is fine. So don't go over the top. I'm saving a little bit because I like to sprinkle it over the scones before they go in um, the oven. So just, you know, save a little bit of it as well. So those effectively are my dry ingredients. So just to recap, so I know we've just had some people uh, joining us, 225 grams of gluten-free plain flour. Uh, there are lots of variations that people have asked for, so you could you know, play around with whatever you've got. Um, a quarter to half a teaspoon of xanthan gum, that just helps to bind it. Um, and then one and a half heat teaspoons of baking powder. Um, and then if you want a little bit of xylitol and sugar, um, just to sweeten it. And then just very gently mix it. Now the, the key with scones, um, and this is really good with children, is light, 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 don't overwork this. Um, then to your mixture. Um, and this is where you could make it dairy free. 50 grams of a fat. Now, um, if you don't want it dairy free, butter. Um, unsalted, salted, doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. I generally use unsalted. Um, or um, I often will do it with dairy free spread. Um, haven't actually tried it with coconut oil, but I don't see why it wouldn't. But I would make sure the coconut oil uh, was cut up into very small pieces, um, but don't see why it wouldn't work with coconut oil either. It's a nice hard fat, to be honest. Then, and this is a great one for children, I don't want them sticking all of their hands into the mixture. What that will do is make a very heavy dough. So you want your tips of your fingers. Um, I would, if you're doing it with children, I would cut up the butter into very small pieces because if they've you know, got great big chunks in there, then they're more likely to be heavy handed. Um, Chris, do you want to just come in? I'll just move the scones, what I mean. Um, so this is a good basic cooking skill children need to learn. I can't stress this enough. I work with a lot of children. I'm a trained teacher. Um, and one of the key basic skills we want them to learn is rubbing in. Because if they can master this, then they can also start going for things like pastries and so on as well. So it's the tips of your fingers. And all you're effectively doing is, as it says, rubbing the fat between your fingers and the flour. And I'm lifting up the flour all the time. That's important. I don't want to get my whole hand in there. I want to do it very lightly. By doing this, and particularly when it comes to, you know, gluten-free flours, you want minimum handling, keeping it nice and light and airy. One of the benefits, to be fair, with gluten-free baking, and this is so true of pastry, and if you're new to gluten-free baking, check out my YouTube channel. I have got a really good um, recipe and a demo uh, gluten-free pastry. Not only that, because short crust is, is something I make a lot uh, for sort of quiches, paint, you know, tarts and things like that, but also for getting good at pastry, try puff pastry because you can do it gluten-free. And honestly, it's just a game changer. If you love to sort of home bake and you miss some of your favorites uh, with puff, um, you can make your own. So I have got on my YouTube channel, which is Christine Bailey in the Kitchen, um, two great videos. They're probably one of the most popular actually, short crust and puff pastry. Um, and again, you know, learning those sort of basic skills of rubbing in is so, so important 
uh, for children, whether they're gluten-free or not, it doesn't really make a difference. They need to learn these skills. Um, I think we've got a question. Hi, a question from Susie. Could you leave out the sugar stroke sweetener and fruit and add cheese? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So Susie, I think you probably missed um, at the beginning I was saying this. This is really just a very basic recipe and you can play around with this. So if you want a savoury one, and we do this a lot at home, is what I would do is absolutely take out the uh, sweetener. Um, you could even add something like a little bit of salt, maybe even a little bit of Dijon mustard as well. Um, and then some grated cheese that could be Parmesan, but it could also be the dairy free cheese. I've made vegan ones. Sometimes I'll also saute off a few um, chopped onions and add that to the mixture. Just make sure the onion is not too wet or too oily when you stir it in. The other things I've done, sun-dried tomatoes. So jar of sun-dried tomatoes. Again, make sure that you've patted them so they're not too oily. Chop them into small pieces, stir that in. So this is when you would do that. So once you've done your rubbing in, this is when you add whatever flavoring you like. You could also stir in at this point, a teaspoon of pesto, dairy-free or whatever. Um, and we effectively make a herb type um, uh, scone instead. So yes, absolutely same ingredients in terms of the ratios, just vary the flavorings. Now my oven, you probably just heard, has just bleeped at me. And um, so I'm just gonna check, I put some in earlier, um, just to show you, you know, I mean, we're talking simple, quick, easy. So these are, I'm just going to close my oven. You don't really want to see my oven. Uh, so these are literally, um, just literally just come out um, of the oven. I'll show you those in a sec, but I'll just show you the rest of the ingredients first. Um, but, you know, 15, 20 minutes in the oven and they're done. Um, so that was the dry ingredients. Then this is when you would add your flavourings. So to this, I have got, my oven is bleeping at me, um, I've got just raisins, so again, vary whatever you've got, you know, and, and in terms of the quantity, around about, for this amount of flour, around about 60 to 70 grams, you don't want to overload it, um, and then just very lightly stir that in, so this is where you would if you wanted to make it savoury, add in your grated cheese, your chopped onion. I would cook the onion first, sun-dried tomatoes, herbs, whatever, black pepper, salt, whatever. Um, then we're going to add our wet mixture. Now, again, if you're dairy-free, coconut milk, soya milk, you know, almond would work absolutely fine. Um, I've actually got here kefir, just because I have kefir, um, I like the sourness of kefir in scones. Um, and obviously you could have coconut kefir, it doesn't have to be milk based. You don't have to have kefir. Um, so you can just use ordinary milk um, or um, you know, a dairy free alternative. Now, the amount you need is going to be a roundabout, and it is a roundabout, because it will depend on the absorbency of your flour but around about 140 millilitres or 140 grams, that sort of amount. But you can see what I'm doing is I'm not adding it all in one go. Just take your time just to stir it in. At, at the point where it starts to combine, be careful that you don't over wet the dough um, because what I don't want is for you to pour too much in and then think, oh, it's too wet, and then you start adding more flour, and then it just affects the whole mixture, and you'll end up with quite a heavy, dense scone. Now, you can see that this is now starting to come together. At this point, with your clean hands, you are going to, and I may need a little bit more liquid, but um, what you're going to do is press the dough um, against the side of the bowl. Um, and as you are doing that, um, you will find that it starts coming together. So don't rush at adding loads and loads of liquid. 
um, because what you will find is that it will actually come together. I think we've got another question. Question from Pat. Can you Hi, use Pat. can you use live yogurts? Yes, you could use live yogurt. Absolutely, you could. About the same amount, so you know, weigh it out, 140 grams. That would actually be really nice. In fact, you'll find on my website there's a really good recipe for it's a gluten-free flatbread and it's similar to this um, and I use yogurt in that um, so yogurt is a really nice because I like that sourness um, that's a really good way of using it so yes yogurt would work um, Chris do you want to just do a quick close-up because um, you can see there, I didn't need to use any extra liquid. So that was about 140 grams or 140 mils of kefir milk or, or something. And all I've done is just press the mixture to the side of the glass bowl. And can you see that it's come together? Now, I'll take it out. It will feel moist. It shouldn't be wet and soggy, but it shouldn't be dry. So when you touch your dough, it should feel nice and moist. Now at this point, I'm just going to use a... You shouldn't need very much. Don't dry out your dough. I can't stress that enough. All I'm going to do now, and you don't need a rolling pin, is I'm just going to press it down with my hands, like so. Now I would say, get it to about a thickness of say two centimeters to like them slightly chunkier rather than really thin um, scones and then with your cutter now because this dough will be slightly more moist what I tend to do is just put a little bit of flour on the in my round cutter um, it could be any you know it could be a fluted cutter it doesn't really matter this is just one of my ring cutters that I often use for roasties and Got your um, baking tray ready. I tend to do, you could put greaseproof paper on there, don't think you really need that to be honest. Um, uh, what you're going to do, press down, um, try not to sort of twist it because uh, you want it to rise. Um, just take away the dough. I mean, you, with this amount of dough, you should be able to get at least four, six, depending on the size of your cutter, um, scones out of there. Once you've taken off your cutter, what I tend to do is just um, round it off with the sides of my hand first, just so you've got a nice even shape all the way round, and then just very carefully lift it up, place it uh, on your tray. Um, obviously with um, <clears throat> raisin scones, you know, sometimes you'll have a raisin sticking out, so just, you know, fiddle around with that just to make it nice and smooth. And then again, exactly the same thing. If you think it's going to stick, put a little bit of flour on the inside of your uh, cutter before placing it down. Don't twist too much. Just take out your dough and then you're going to press it out gently just neaten it up again like so and um, now one thing i would say is ideally because you've got a baking agent in here you've got baking powder uh, you may have say for example you know some sour um you know yogurt or kefir that will help it to rise while you can prepare these in advance i personally think it's better to cook them straight away um, because then you'll, they'll rise better. Um, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, they don't take very long to prepare. Um, I would tend to, at this point, get them in the oven. Um, now, I'll just show you what I tend to do uh, with this stage. So once you've neatened them off, like so, um, they're not gonna flatten out, so they can be quite close together. They're going to rise, but what we want is a nice golden colour. Um, and what I've got here is just a little bit of, this could be milk or dairy-free milk. Uh, don't waste eggs, you don't need to use an egg uh, for glazing. Now what I tend to do is brush the sides as well, so just very gently. 
because I like the sides to look nice and golden and the tops as well. Tiny bit, not so much. I think we've got another question. Question from uh, Riddell. Uh, uh, hi, hi, Christine. How much butter again? So 50 grams. So it's actually quite a small amount. So two, two, I'll go over the ingredients in a sec. The other thing, just to say, when I brush them with a little bit of milk or dairy-free milk, I then would normally, with the sweet ones anyway, just sprinkle over a little bit of the xylitol over the top before they go in the oven. Just because it gives it a nice crisp, sort of crunchy top and then you bite into it and it's lovely and moist and soft underneath. So that's why I tend to do that. You don't have to. And obviously if you're doing a savoury one, uh, you, you wouldn't do that anyway. Um, then they go into a hot oven. So if you've got a fan assisted, 200 degrees. If you haven't, I would actually whack it up to 210, 220. You need to allow at least 15 minutes. I would check it after 15, um, but sometimes, depending on your oven, up to 20 minutes they're going to need. Um, take them out, allow them to cool on your work surface for, or, or, or you know, tray for around about five minutes before lifting them off. Um, they're going to be nice and robust. I'm just going to show you these ones that I literally have just taken out of the oven. Um, these ones I gave 17 minutes to be precise. Um, and I'm just, what I'm going to do is cut one up and then at the end, I'm going to go through all the ingredients for you um, just in case you've missed any. Um, so just bear with me while I just uh, uh, cut one up for you. Um, so, um, you should be able to either lift them off or just to use your spatula to take them off. Those are nice and um, wooden anyway. And I just want to show you what they look like inside. Um, so these have literally just come out of the oven. Give them about five minutes um, just so that they cool down. Um, you're trying to try and get the kids not to cut them off straight away, it'll be too hot. But you can see, do you want to do a close-up, Chris? Just so, I just want to show you the texture, really, because they are just like ordinary, really honest with them. So you can see through. I mean, you can see a bit of steam, hopefully, coming out. Um, they shouldn't be, you know, really dense inside. They should be light, fluffy, um, you know, just like ordinary, regular scones. So a really simple recipe, absolutely delicious. And again, if you're making them savoury, first option, you know, a nice sort of cheese scone, cheese and onion scone, sort of, you know, Easter treat for brunch um, or later on in the day as well. So a great recipe for children to make, very little in terms of equipment, you know, anything that they're going to harm themselves with. Plus, they get to start learning basic, you know, skills like the rubbing in, like the flattening out, like the cutting, you know, the glazing. These are all skills that if you've got children heading into their GCSE food and technology, they are going to have to learn. Um, and what a you know, great recipe to get them to try. Um, we've got one more question and then I'll go through all the ingredients as well. And please let me know, post on our Facebook page if you make them, because I'd really like to see you know, your creations, your variations of flavours as well, because it'd be a great one to get, uh, um, you know, baking this weekend. So a quick question I think we've got. A uh, <coughs> couple of questions and a comment. So it's interesting you mentioned about GCSEs yes. and Natasha's son has been learning about them. So I think he's going to be uh, yes. doing that at lunchtime. Natasha, fantastic. If he wants, <clears throat> because I do go into schools and teach at that level and A level, if he needs any other recipes or... Um, or if you want me to do another demo, more specifically towards those sort of skill set, uh, do let me know because, you know, there's lots, I'll tell you why, because I've had my boys go through GCSEs, um, they are great bakers now, they are great cooks, and I'm not joking, it's for, for Nathan, who's now at uni, well, sort of at uni, um, you know, it was one of the best things I think he ever did because when he got to uni, I wrote a gluten-free student book for him, which is, is also available. But he learned those basic skills. And, you know, one of the downsides of having an allergy 
asked is you go through GCSE, the practicals, and you're told to make pastries, you're told to make bread, you're told to make pasta. Converting those to gluten-free is not so easy. Um, and it's harder, you know, for, I've, I've just literally done a YouTube pasta video, gluten-free pasta, but it's not the same. Um, and you have to sort of tweak recipes to make them work for allergies. So, you know, celiacs and people with allergies going through those food tech exams, sometimes they have to end up making, you know, the, the gluten version in order to get the best skills um, in terms of the results and the scoring. But the skills are the same, rubbing in, you know, the blending, the whisking, the folding in, all of those are skills are the same. So if there are anything um, that you would like me to do a demo for, you know, children specifically, just let me know. Um, because it's a real passion of mine to get, you know, children to learn those basic skills. So Natasha, if he does um get this recipe going this weekend post some pictures because i'll do a big shout out to him um because you know this is a tough time for children anyway so well done you well done you i hope he does get involved um and i think we've got another question cool great so first of all natasha, natasha says thank you for that it's a great no opportunity problem. for her and her son to spend some quality yes, time together definitely. couple of questions well first one from natasha what's the oven temperature so the oven temperature, if you've got fan assisted, so I've got a fan, um, I did it at 200 degrees C, so that's gas mark six. Um, if you haven't, I would actually whack it up to 220, so it's almost like you're making bread. With bread, um, you normally whack it up to that sort of temperature. 15 minutes, check it. Sometimes ovens need up to 20 minutes, so 15 to 20 minutes. These had 17 minutes to be precise. Um, they should be nice and golden on the, on the top and when you cut through them, like I showed you, it should be nice and cooked through. There shouldn't be a dense, you know, wet bit in the middle. Um, but around about sort of 15 to 17 minutes in the oven. Um, any more questions? And then I'll go through, so please don't worry, I'll go through all the ingredients again. So if you've got a pen, paper, get it now because um, I'll tell you the, all the ingredients again. Question from Dorota regarding when Hi, you... Hi, nice to see you. When, when, regarding when you add live yoghurt, yes. does the temperature when you bake the scones, will that kill the live yes, streams it, of bacteria? Yes, it will. So beneficial bacteria boost. Um, but what it does do is because of the sourness, it often helps with things like breads and cakes to give a slightly lighter, fluffier texture. And I quite like that little hint of sourness. So that's why I'm using it. Um, I wouldn't be you know, using it for probiotic boost. You could then slather, you know, um, you know sort of a thick Greek yogurt onto these uh, when you're eating it, that would be brilliant. Uh, but no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be thinking that I'd be getting a probiotic boost um, as a result. It just gives it a nice, texture and a nice sourness so sometimes here i've got two pots of kefir going one coconut one ordinary and sometimes we're just not consuming it um, in a raw state enough so i tend to have excess so i love it to use it in breads and baking for that reason purposely as well um, shall i go through all the ingredients again yeah how's everyone doing everyone okay i hope you're going to be uh, doing this today, please let us know uh, if you are and please post any images. It'd be great to see you in the kitchen. So round up 225 grams of gluten-free plain flour. You can use variations which we talked about. To that, a quarter to a half teaspoon of xanthan gum. Then at one and a half heat teaspoons of baking powder. Then if you're gonna add a sweetener, around about one tablespoon, I use one tablespoon of xylitol. Mix that together. Then you add your fat, which is 50 grams. Butter, dairy-free spread. Rub that in. Then to that mixture, add whatever flavoring. So I used uh, about 60, 70 grams of raisins. Uh, stir that in. Then add your wet mixture, which is 140 grams or milliliters or something like kefir, yogurt, or milk. Stir that in, form a soft, but not too wet dough. 
and then cut out your scones, glaze them. I also sprinkled them with a little bit of xylitol, then bake them in the oven 200 degrees if it's fanned for 15 to 20 minutes, 220 otherwise. Um, allow them to just cool on the tray for about five minutes, and then they're ready to eat. And that's it, really, really simple. So I think we've got one more question before we finish. Quick question from Sue, can you use uh, bicarbonate of sto soda instead of baking powder? I wouldn't, Sue, no. You could if you were using a sour. So if you were using kefir, you might be able to get away with bicarbonate, but I would generally use bicarbonate with cream of tartar, which then helps uh, cause it to rise more. Baking um, soda or bicarbonate soda tends to sort of flatten them and make them spread out more. Uh, but if you're using something like kefir, you may be able to get away with it. I would reduce it to around about a teaspoon, uh, but I find baking powder better uh, for giving it that light, fluffy sort of rise. Um, so try and use baking powder instead. And one more question. From Jill. Hi, Jill. Is sugar a direct replacement for, for xylitol? Yes, absolutely. So if you just want to use a bit of caster sugar, uh, a tablespoon is enough. Quite frankly, I don't think you really need that sweetness if you're having raisins and things like that. I'm not a great fan of sugar, as you probably know. Um, you could use coconut sugar, but it would just make the scones a little bit more grey brown uh, in colour. So yeah, tablespoon. Right, so thank you everyone for staying with me on this Easter Saturday. We will have this posted live for you on the Facebook page. Um, so hopefully you, if you miss some of it, you'll be able to catch up. Look forward to doing another demo with you. Um, we've got loads more on our YouTube channel. We're also doing Instagram lives as well. So check out, out our Instagram page, which is Christine M. Bailey and have a really good Easter everyone. See you all soon.